So this has been an excellent discussion. I really appreciate all of the input, but I'd like to ask each of the panelists for any additional insight regarding the diagnosis and management of advanced prostate cancer. So, Dr. Shore, final thoughts. Well, well first, uh, you know, thank you, Raul, for allowing me to participate in the panel and the, the OncLive team. Great job, as always. You know, um, great discussion. Uh, there's a lot of tremendous new uh, information and diagnosis and management, as we've discussed. And I think the point that strikes me is that it's complicated now. It's not like it was when I finished residency, uh, let alone when I was in medical school. And so for the, the, uh, the urologist and the radiation oncologist and medical oncologist in the community, I think there's sort of two uh, things worth contemplating. One is that you've got to really be dedicated to this space now to do what's in the best interest for your patients. And that seems a very hackneyed, simplified thing to say, but it is pretty complicated and getting more complicated with all of the data that's out there. So the notion that I have to keep uh, harping on to our colleagues, especially in urology, is specialization, subspecialization, and collaborate, especially if you're in a large group or you have a lot of folks that uh, you work with. And I think the same would be true for medical oncology and radiation oncology. Um, and, and, and so there really does take a dedication to really keep up with this literature uh, because there's just more and more of it coming. That's the, the challenge. The good news is we're doing much better for our patients. They're living longer, staying out of the emergency room, staying out of the hospital, maintaining quality of life. Great. Mike? Yeah, uh, many ways echoing the same things. We have more questions than answers. Uh, and so with that, uh, you know, we really just have to watch a lot of the trends and sort of also sort of in many ways stick to your guns, but also sort of be uh, an early adapter for some of these changes because, you know, we've already talked a little bit today about the tendency with more high risk or oligometastatic disease to be more aggressive. You know, is that a trend or is that the right thing to be doing? To more advanced disease, I still think there are so many questions and so clinical trials remain sort of a, a focus for, uh, you know, research centers like ours, but I think out in the community where the real, you know, management goes on, we've really got to get folks on trials. Evan? Uh, I would emphasize the point, there's many points that one could talk about, but I'd emphasize the point that uh, this is something that we can do now, which is all of us take a better family history. And it's something that we can alter now, and it's a little bit of a different take because it's not just about the implications for the patient, uh, potential therapeutic implications, prognostic implications, et cetera, uh, but it has implications potentially for family members of so the patients. And we always want to, when we can, in oncology, to cure cancer if we can, and if we can't, to at least extend survival and improve quality of life. But this is an opportunity where we might be able to prevent cancers, get it before it even starts, by identifying uh, patients and families that are at high risk. Right. Well stated. Glenn? This is a rewarding time to be dealing with patients with castrate resistant disease. It's a lethal disease and we're gaining new tools. And as the trials complete and we learn more about imaging, how to combine the therapies, and if we continue to work in a collaborative fashion, we're gonna have a lot more to offer our patients. Perfect. So on behalf of our entire panel, we'd like to thank you for joining us and we hope you found this peer exchange useful and informative. And again, many thanks.